In this video, I'm gonna discuss what meniscus tears are, why surgery might not be the best option, and provide a comprehensive rehab program, including exercise progressions with sets and reps. The meniscus is a fibrocartilaginous structure located between the femur or thigh bone and tibia or shin bone. There are two in each knee, the medial meniscus located on the inner portion of the knee and the lateral meniscus located on the outer portion. They function to provide shock absorption, force transmission, and stability to the knee joint. Meniscus tears are either traumatic, in which there is a distinct mechanism of injury, or non-traumatic, which occurs secondary to age-related changes. They are often classified according to location and orientation. Tears can be vertical longitudinal, radial, horizontal, oblique, or complex. Vertical or oblique tears that twist and fold over within the joint are termed bucket handle tears. Over the years, the presence of pain and mechanical symptoms, such as clicking, catching, and locking of the knee, were thought to be caused by a meniscus tear. Therefore, in order to reduce symptoms, surgery to repair or remove the meniscus was performed. However, the current scientific literature does not fully support this theory. Here are three things you should know. The first is that there is not a simple cause and effect relationship between symptoms and tears. For example, a 2018 study found that these mechanical symptoms were equally prevalent in patients with and without a meniscal tear, and are actually common in those with knee problems in general. Other research has concluded that these symptoms have limited utility as an indicator for the presence of meniscal tears or are not useful clues to the diagnosis. Secondly, meniscus tears are common in asymptomatic individuals. In this one study, researchers found that in 230 uninjured knees, 30% had meniscal tears. So if tears are prevalent in a non-painful population, it brings into question the efficacy of surgery in reducing symptoms. This leads us to the third and final point. Surgery to remove or repair the meniscus has not been shown to lead to better outcomes compared to other interventions. For example, in this popular study, researchers compared a partial meniscectomy, a surgery where part of the meniscus is removed, to a placebo or sham surgery. Over the course of five years, surgery provided no more benefit for knee symptoms or function than placebo surgery. It even led to an increased risk of developing radiographic knee osteoarthritis. In fact, a brand new Cochrane review concluded that arthroscopic surgery for degenerative meniscal tears provides little to no clinical benefit for pain, function, and quality of life compared to placebo surgery. Now, most studies to date have exclusively looked at surgical outcomes in an older population with degenerative meniscus tears, older being those over the age of 40. But there is an observational study which found that younger patients under 40 years old with mechanical symptoms did have greater improvements after surgery compared to those without symptoms. However, the authors did go on to say that randomized control trials are still needed to confirm this potential benefit. This information means that if you have knee symptoms related to a degenerative meniscus tear, surgery is likely not indicated. For traumatic tears in a younger population, the research is not as definitive. But the good news is that exercise has been shown to be just as effective in the long term for both populations. We have one study that showed exercise led to similar improvements in pain, function, and quality of life after 12 months in a younger population with mostly traumatic tears, and another study that showed no clinically relevant difference in the function after two years in an older population with degenerative tears. At this moment, current clinical practice guidelines favor conservative management in those with degenerative meniscus tears. For the exercises, I'm going to present a comprehensive rehab program that covers multiple categories aimed at increasing your capacity and tolerance to various stressors. Within each category, I will provide multiple exercise options, ultimately giving you two different workouts to follow. Before diving into these, there's one caveat I want to mention. 
these exercises are intended for non-surgical cases. If you had surgery, you will ultimately follow a similar framework, but before starting, talk to your doctor or physical therapist as you may have weight-bearing precautions or other considerations to consider. Category one, knee range of motion. Ideally, you should be able to fully straighten your knee and touch your heel to your butt. At minimum, you should aim to restore extension and flexion that is equal to your uninjured side. For knee extension or straightening, here are three options. The first is seated active quad contractions. Straighten your leg and squeeze your quad for 10 seconds. Repeat this for 10 repetitions three times a day. If your motion is improving, you can use a towel or strap to pull up on your foot in order to intensify the stretch. Another option is propping your heel up on an elevated surface for 10 to 15 minutes three times a day. If you need to enhance the stretch, you can add a weight just above your knee. The goal here is low load, long duration. So while it may feel slightly uncomfortable, it should not be unbearable. And finally, once you gain more range of motion, strength and control, add in a banded TKE. Place a band behind the back of your knee, anchor to an object, and perform the same quad contractions against resistance. For knee flexion or bending, here are three options. You can use a stationary bike and start with the seat at a higher level. As range of motion improves, lower the seat to expose the knee to more flexion. Another option are heel slides. You can use a slider on carpet or a towel on a hard surface. Start by actively sliding your heel towards your butt for 10 to 15 repetitions. As motion improves, progress by using a towel or strap to pull the knee into more flexion. You should do these often, so at least three times a day, every day. And finally, a more advanced option is quadruped rockbacks or tall kneeling rockbacks. I recommend kneeling on a pad or pillow for these, and you can even experiment with using a towel behind the knee. Anecdotally, I have found this to help patients move into more knee flexion with less discomfort. Category two, hip, knee, and ankle strength. Let's start with a four-step split squat progression, which will help increase your tolerance to weight-bearing knee flexion in deeper positions. Level one, body weight squat. Your goal is to perform three sets of 20 repetitions, getting your hips to at least parallel. If you need, start with hand assistance, such as using a TRX or another object. Level two, heels elevated squat. Elevate your heels two to three inches. This will help keep your torso more upright and allow you to go deeper, moving your knee into more flexion. Your goal is three sets of 20 repetitions, and again, try to get your hips to at least parallel. Level three, split squat. Stand in a split stance and lower down while driving the front knee forward as far as you can. Your goal is three sets of 15 controlled reps on each leg before progressing. And level four, front foot elevated split squat. Elevate your front foot on an object two to four inches high and lower down, driving the front knee forward. Over time, you can increase depth and add weight. The second quadriceps option is a single leg knee extension for three to four sets of 10 to 15 reps on each leg. Your goal is to move through the full range of motion with the weight at a challenging intensity, but to start, you can shorten the range of motion or even perform with no weight if needed. For the hamstrings, the first option will emphasize knee flexion. You can perform standing knee flexion with an ankle weight, use machines, or an exercise I like to use, hamstring sliders. Start with double leg eccentric sliders. Bridge up, slowly straighten your knees, lower down, and repeat. Build up to moving through your full range of motion, and then progress to double leg sliders, where you keep your hips up the whole time. Next, you will move on to single leg eccentric sliders, and finally, to single leg sliders.
The second option is a weighted single leg RDL, which will focus on hip extension. Keep a slight bend in the knee and hinge in your hips, lowering until your chest is about parallel to the ground. If you struggle with balance, you can do these with a hand supported on a wall or object, but ultimately your goal should be able to do these without upper body assistance. Next up are options for targeting the outer and inner hip muscles. These can also help reduce discomfort you may experience on the outside or inside of your knee. First is a three-step side plank progression for targeting the outside hip muscles, the abductors. Start with a short side plank isometric, progress to a side plank isometric, and then you can perform a side plank with hip abduction, where you slowly lift and lower the top leg under control. The second option is a four-step Copenhagen plank progression for targeting the inside hip muscles, the adductors. Start with a supine ball squeeze isometric. Lie on your back and place a ball or pillow between your ankles. Squeeze as hard as you can, keeping pain to a tolerable level. Once you can do that, you can perform a short Copenhagen plank isometric. Here, you set up in a side plank with your top knee on a bench or chair and hold for time. Then, progress to a long Copenhagen plank isometric. And finally, you can work up to the long Copenhagen plank where you lower and lift your bottom hip and leg under control. And lastly, calf specific strength. Again, here are two options. First, a knee straight progression where you will start with double leg heel raises from the floor, then progress to single leg. And finally, you will increase the range of motion by performing a deficit single leg heel raise. To make these harder, add weight over time. The other calf option is performing a knee bent variation. I personally like the seated deficit heel raise. You can use a barbell, dumbbells, or another type of weight. Start with your toes on an object about two to four inches high and place the weight on the top of your knees. To make this easier, you can perform these on the ground or use less weight, but the deficit is a good goal to build up to. Category three, balance or proprioception. Start by standing on one leg on flat ground with hands across your chest and eyes straight ahead. Don't let your leg touch the ground or your standing leg and keep your torso upright. Once you can complete three sets of 30 seconds without losing balance, here are two dynamic options to try. The first is a single leg RDL progression, which places an emphasis on moving predominantly through the hips. Start with a single leg RDL without letting the other foot touch the ground. If needed, move through less range of motion, but your goal is to eventually get your torso about parallel to the floor. You then progress by adding a knee drive. And finally, you can perform a three-way RDL with a knee drive. With this one, you will reach the arms in three directions, to the left, middle, and then to the right. The second option is the wide balance. You still move through the hips, but it places slightly more emphasis on loading through the knee. Stand on one leg and reach out in three different directions with the opposite leg, creating a Y shape. Your goal is to reach as far as you can and then return to the starting position without losing balance. Start with smaller reaches and then increase the distance over time. Category four, optional stretching. You can add in various stretches if you're looking to further increase knee range of motion or simply because you find that it feels good. One option is the couch stretch. Start in a half kneeling position and elevate your back foot on a bench or chair. Tuck your pelvis and lean back towards your heel. You can hold this for time or move in and out of this position. Another option is alternating knee extension. Place your hands flat on the floor or on an elevated surface. Gently bend one knee while keeping the other straight. Hold for a second or two, and then alternate between legs. Category five, optional plyometrics. 
If you intend to run, play sports, or are looking to improve your tolerance to jumping and landing, then you should include plyometrics. Ideally, perform these prior to strength exercises. Here are two examples. The first option is a bilateral squat jump progression. Start with box jumps to reduce landing impact forces. Progress by removing the box and performing vertical jumps for maximal height. Then progress to a tuck jump to further increase landing intensity. And finally, you can build up to weighted squat jumps. Your focus is on maximal effort each jump, so you are only performing six to eight reps for two to three sets. The second option is a single leg jump progression. Start with step up jumps on the same leg using a box or bench, progress to split squat jumps on the same leg, then to single leg squat jumps for maximal height with a focus on sticking the landing, and finally, you can progress to single leg forward hops over hurdles. Again, place an emphasis on maximal effort each jump, aiming to perform two to three sets of four to six jumps on each leg. Obviously, there are a lot of exercise options, but don't feel like you have to do them all. For example, if the couch stretch or kneeling is not comfortable or does not meet your goals, you don't need to do them. Also, all of these categories can be performed simultaneously and progress independently of one another. For example, you may still be working on regaining full knee flexion, but are able to progress to the weighted single leg deficit heel raises. So to put this all together, your programming might look something like this. In the early stages, focus on improving knee extension and flexion, such as the heel prop and heel slides. Do these often multiple times a day, every day. If you're looking for a minimal program, at the very least, you should place an emphasis on improving range of motion and increasing tolerance to weight-bearing knee flexion, such as performing a squat or split squat variation. However, my recommendation would be taking a comprehensive approach, which covers the previous options, but also includes other strength and balance exercises. Additional considerations include optional stretches and plyometrics, depending on your needs and goals. You will want to perform this rehab plan two to three times a week while keeping pain tolerable during exercise. If your goal is to return to running or playing a certain sport, the plyometric exercises will help you develop some qualities applicable to these activities, but you also want to consider adding in sport-specific drills, such as cutting and change of directions, as well as gradually returning back to your preferred activity. This process will likely take several months in order for you to appropriately build up your volume and tolerance. So to sum up, knee pain and mechanical symptoms are quite common in those with knee problems in general and not specific to meniscus tears. Even if a tear is confirmed, we cannot say with 100% certainty that symptoms are caused by this finding. This brings into question the efficacy of surgery. It may be indicated in some cases, but conservative management is currently recommended as the first line of treatment for knee symptoms related to degenerative meniscal tears and can be an effective option for younger populations with traumatic tears as well. At the very least, you should place an emphasis on improving knee extension and flexion range of motion and increasing tolerance to weight-bearing knee flexion. However, a comprehensive approach which includes other strength and balance exercises are strongly recommended. Depending on your needs and goals, you may choose to add in stretching and plyometrics as well. Again, these exercises and progressions are just some options to follow. Not everyone will need to include plyometrics or progress to the highest level of each exercise. Build up to the level that is most appropriate for you and your goals. Thank you for watching. I know that was a long video, so if you made it this far and found it helpful, do us a favor, tap that like button, subscribe, and if you have any questions or comments, you can drop those down below. Until next time.